Friday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christian Brown, your host, and today we are talking conservatism and where do we go from here. Uh, today we have a new guest on the show who's never been part of the show, but he's graciously accepted the role and coming on to talk about conservative issues and where we move forward. Uh, Spencer Bear is the guest. Thank you so much, Spencer, for doing this. I hopefully pronounced your last name right there. Bennett. Bennett. Why did I think Bear? Bennett, I apologize, Spencer. Spencer, thank you so much for doing this. Hey, happy to help, Chris. Um, before we get started, I'm going to ask the age-old question to anyone who's come on the show. What does conservatism mean to you? <sighs> That's a good question, Chris. I think that my definition of conservatism is starting to shift a little bit over time. Um, initially, then, um, you know, the mantra around conservatives is a couple things. The best social program is a job. That's that's one of the things they like to say, and we'd rather give um, teach a man to fish than give him a fish, right? So um, you know there are many ways to define conservatism, but I think those are two um, sayings that I think relate to it. But as I I married to a nurse, um, and I'm beginning to see you know the need to help vulnerable communities, and that sometimes when we cut funding to vulnerable communities actually comes back and costs us even more. Um, so even just from a fiscal responsibility perspective, the need to make sure that we're, we're funding social programs um, as efficiently as possible to make sure that we're taking care of people. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but, but I, I've started to shift a little bit to the center um, because a balanced budget isn't always the best answer to everything. I, well, you just like completely ruined the next line of questioning because I was going to talk about conservatism, but let's talk about being a centrist conservative in your own words in today's political arena, because it seems like we're more left and right. And I'm sort of in the same boat that you are. I'm sort of a centrist conservative as well. I, I find myself in the middle and looking at both sides and trying to figure out where do, where do I fit in the grand scheme of things. So where do you fit in the grand scheme of things? Because it seems like you are politically homeless in today's society, or do you have a political home in provincial and federal politics? No, I mean, I'm certainly still what I identify as conservative. Um, it doesn't mean that I agree with everything that they do, but um, you may remember, like I was a, a UCP staffer for a year uh, in Treasury Board and Finance, which was an amazing experience. Some incredible people there. Um, <clears throat> and I have friends across the spectrum. Um, and so certainly still conservative, um, but I know that there are many conservatives like myself that are, you know, more centrist than, um, I mean, how do you define far right? Usually those that are on the far right think that somebody else is further right than they are. So they're far right. It's not, it's not them. Um, but uh, yeah. So um, pragmatic, maybe. Is yeah, that word? Well, I'm not sure. I, I like that word. And that's the word I use a lot in this household uh, against my husband. And he always looks at me oddly when I use that word, because he is very much not a conservative in this household. He is on the left spectrum and I am not. So it's interesting fights uh, or political debates uh, every night when we talk about politics. Um, I'm assuming like you and your wife, uh, who might not be on the conservative uh, wing as well, but she might be, I don't know. Um, no, in fact, uh, so she's, um, and I made a post on this a while ago, so she is a nurse and um, has worked with very vulnerable communities, and, and so she's, you know, I wouldn't say far left, but not conservative, <laughs> <laughs> and I bought her a Janice Irwin mug, um, uh, so you had to make a donation to the NDP, that was the hardest part, but I made a donation to the NDP um, in her name, or she made a donation to the NDP, we got a mug, um, because I think that you we can still get along great, uh, even if we come from different ideologies. So I, I, I could not agree more with that. I, I want to ask the question because we are a month and a half, two months away fr uh, from the last election, the federal election, and we are a few days away from the return of parliament. Um, let's talk about the last election first off. As a conservative, as someone who considers themselves to be a centrist conservative, how did you feel like the federal conservatives did in that election? You know, that's hard to say. I wish we would have done better, of course. Um, but I think that if your party, uh, the liberals, when they were, you know, they were in power, that they called an election when they felt like they could win a majority. Um, 
And I would hope that they have people who are smart or, or assume that they're smart, some strategists and stuff that decided that this was the most ideal time to call an election to get a majority. Um, they felt like they, in a hockey sense, that they were on the power of play and they could score some goals. Uh, and they didn't. Um, you know, the results were like trading in my 2008 Toyota Corolla with 300,000 kilometers for another 2008 Toyota Corolla with 300,000 kilometers. Um, so not much changed. Um, I don't know whether either side can claim a victory, but I certainly don't think it was a, a, a strong victory by the Liberals by any means. Was there anything that you saw in the campaign that the Conservatives could have done a little bit better on? Or uh, because I, I, I think Canadians were just apathetic in this last election, and that's from my own personal opinion. It seems like people did not get out to the polls like they did in 2019 or even 2015. In your opinion, could, there, could they have done anything more or because it was one of those weird summer elections where no one really cared and no one was really paying attention until the last week it was what it was you know i think that the curveball was covid um because um a lot of um, people who would identify on the conservative spectrum um may not even be anti-vax i think that term is maybe used too often but vaccine hesitant um, and I think that um, conservatives having a similar position, by the way, I'm double vaccinated and I think that everybody sh else should be. Um, but I think that, that um, their position on that, which I think was the right position, but I think that turned a lot of people to Mad Max's party. Um, even in Spruce Grove, it was funny, I attended a Dane Lloyd fundraiser event and Danielle Smith came, Dane Lloyd's my MP. Danielle Smith came, it was a big, you know, very successful fundraiser. And at the same time, then Max Bernier held a, you know, a rally at a church in Spruce Grove, and the church was packed. Um, nobody was wearing a mask. They might have had more people than we did. It was it was crazy. Um, and and their biggest thing was the vaccine passport. Um, so I think that if you know, like the last provincial election, then I campaigned for the UCP, and it was jobs, the economy, pipelines. Chris, do you think those are a good idea? Perfect. Can we count on your support? Great. Very simple economy yeah. message, right? But COVID threw a curveball that is hard to find answers that everybody agrees with. Did you door knock for Dane while during the last election, or were you yeah. out volunteering? Yeah. Did you yeah. did you hear vaccine? Because I, I I used to work up in Slave Lake, so I know Dane's love riding quite well because I used to go back and forth to Edmonton almost every other weekend. What were you hearing at the doors? Were people worried about jobs, the economy, and uh, work, or were they worried about vaccines? You know, what I heard the most was Jason Kenny's name. Um, and uh, so we had to um, uh, say, don't worry, this is federal, not provincial, and I'd speak really slow. Um, and I would say, so do you like Justin Trudeau? And they would say, no. I'd say, great. We're the Conservatives against Justin Trudeau. Oh, okay. And then we were able to make that transition. Um, but that so, was one of um Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, you, you just opened up Pandora's box for me because um, the last week of the campaign basically was thrown up in the air because Jason Kenney came out and announced his I, for, I forget the name of the program, but basically a vaccine passport. I, 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 um, I, there is an actual name that he used, but it was a vaccine passport in name only. Um, That's right. This changed the name for Aaron O'Toole because Aaron O'Toole was put on his heels. And I assume that's when you started hearing a lot of those, are you Jason Kenny? Are you with Jason Kenny? Um, did that hurt the Conservatives in Alberta and potentially Canada when Jason Kenney, who kind of is the uh, heir apparent to the Conservative movement across Canada, did it hurt the Conservatives across Canada when Jason Kenney, who is a traditional blue Conservative, has come out and adopted a liberal policy in some sense? <sighs> Yes, um, I think that that hurt um, on the, and again, I don't like labels, but I think that that um, helped the PPC vote. Um, on the other side, though, um, I think that a fair criticism of the UCP was that they were probably two weeks slow on reacting to the fourth wave. And I think that that um, had a stronger reaction at the doors. It wasn't so much um, the 
people against the vaccine passport. It was people that said, Alberta has the highest COVID rates right now in Canada. We bumbled the response rate. And if your guy has anything to do with Jason Kenney, I don't want anything to do with him. Um, so I think that it was more so the centrists, um, the undecided, just the regular Joes that thought that COVID was being mishandled and that we were too slow in our response. Uh, I'm talking to many people across this province and across this country, and I, uh, they say that exact the same thing that you just said. But at the end of the day, does Justin Trudeau not have to wear some of this as well? Does he not have to wear what the provinces are doing? Because he is the leader of the country and the provinces are getting their information from the chief medical officers, but also Justin Trudeau, who's been handing out the vaccines. So while Jason Kenney can be labeled with not uh, addressing it quick enough, doesn't Justin Trudeau have to bear some responsibility on this as well? I mean, I'd love to blame Trudeau for everything, <laughs> right? Um, ask me the next question. I'll just blame Trudeau on that as well. That's not a problem. Um, I think that what Trudeau dropped the ball on was not procuring vaccines fast enough. Um, when you when you look at a lot of our neighbors, and I think, and I all the waves blur together, but I think that our third wave um, was worse than it could have been, or maybe it's the second wave, because we were, I don't know, a month or two slower than some of our neighbors at procuring vaccines. Um, but I mean, and, and like, I'd love to blame Trudeau for everything, but I think you look at what the jurisdictions are and what people have control over. Um, and I feel like when the fourth wave started to ramp up, um, and again, as a UCP concert, a supporter, I wish that we'd heard from the premier or from um, Hinshaw or from Shandro. They were radio silent for too long, I feel like, and the lack of response for too long. And an early response could have slowed down that wave. Um, so I, I, um, I'd love to pass the buck over, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think there was things in our, in the provincial control that they, um, didn't handle as well as they could have. So as we mentioned in the top of the show, there was no change. This election was basically a status quo election. We have the almost exact same results as we did in 2019. The Conservatives, after this election, seem to be falling over themselves uh, federally with the vaccine passport, vaccine mandates. Um, until they get that sorted out, I don't think they can move forward. Do you? Or is, is, it, is it good to have dissenting opinions in a caucus like the Conservatives like this? Uh, so I think that you do, that um, dissenting opinions can be a healthy form of democracy. You don't want to have just yes men. Um, but back to your point on vaccines I and, and the COVID packs and the passport and so forth. Um, I think that um, the vaccine response or the COVID response or lack thereof or too much <laughs> thereof, depending on who you talk to, is what caused the two MLAs to leave Drew Barnes and Todd Lowen and has caused, you know, there was a... Um, an anti-lockdown letter signed by half a dozen MLAs or so saying we shouldn't lock down. So um, Jason Kenney or the Conservatives provincially are hemmed in because on, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm labeling these, but on the left wing, people want more restrictions. And on the far right, and again, I don't know who's far right and who's not, but they think that we should have no restrictions. And then you have the people in the middle that think, well, you know, we probably need a certain degree of restrictions. And so um, like if you looked at the comment section when the premier posted something, you would have people saying you're a dictator and we're back in, you know, Germany, like it's stupid, um, from, from people who might identify as conservative. And on the other side, they would say, you're killing babies. Um, you know, we need to lock it down and let's, what, what's that term they wanted again? The, the last one, it's like lock everything down. Yeah. The term. So Anyways. Total I, lockdown. So the range of opinions is so torn and, and the premier is getting attacked on both sides. So it's, it's a hard balance for sure. I, I, I have said this publicly a few times, but never on the record, but I'm going to say it now. Um, so my surgery was canceled at the beginning of August when the fourth wave happened. I think everyone sort of saw that when CBC did an article on me and then Global did an article on as well down in Calgary. I, I said this during the interviews, but they didn't, they didn't air this part, but I don't blame Jason Kenney. 
I don't blame Jason Kenny. I do not blame Tyler Shandro. I do not blame Dina Henshaw for my surgery being canceled. And I think that pisses a lot of people on the, what, like you said, don't want to know what the left is, but on the left you say, well, 15,000 surgeries have been canceled under the conservatives, so you're killing people. No, you know who's killing people? The people who aren't getting fucking vaccinated. Pardon my French there, everyone who's listening, yeah. but the people who aren't getting vaccinated. You can only dangle the carrot in front of people's mouths for so long before you have to finally say enough is enough, and we just have to you have to suck it up because if you don't, you're going to be in lockdowns forever. And if you don't want it, get the jab. It's safe right. and it's efficient. That's right. And and like a, at the time, I think a lot of that was driven by a lot of rural Albertans. Um, and I heard from certain MLAs that they said, and I'm making up the town, it doesn't matter which town, but Bruderheim or Peace River, for example, yeah. the vaccine rate was so low that you had ambulances literally on call going back and forth, picking up covid icu patients you know um uh, i like like bad covid patients from bruderheim to the Edmonton hospital back and forth and back and forth you know they couldn't put hospitals fast enough at one point to pick up um as many people as were getting really really sick in some of these small towns and and i don't know if an ndp government would have changed the attitude of folks in bruderheim for example, maybe Bruderheim is an exemption. So don't, it's not Bruderheim specifically, but. I, I have said that from day one as well. If, uh, if the NDP were in, in power right now, what would they have done differently? People still wouldn't have gotten it. There are still a portion of the population that would have still said, nope, we're not getting the jab. We don't care who you are. We're just not going to do it. So I, I, I highly suspect people who say the NDP would have done a better job at this. Prove it. You can't because you they aren't in power. So you cannot tell me that they would do something different because they can tell you that they're going to do something different, but they know the information now and they're saying hindsight's 50-50. So there's my, there's my dig at the NDP for five minutes. Well, and the NDP, <laughs> like, like there was protests under things that the UCP did. There was protests, especially like Grace Life Church, you know, like it was messy. Um, and imagine um, how messy it would have been if the NDP imposed the lockdowns that they were talking about doing. Like the protests would have been bad. <laughs> like it would have been super messy. Um, and so I, and at the beginning, then they wanted to, so this was um, prior to September of last year, they said things like only schools at 50% capacity and you wanna hire 50,000 new teachers, whatever the number was. And, and so I asked NDP supporters, where are you going to find the teachers from that you're proposing in your plan? Where are you going to find enough school spaces? You know, they presented these unrealistic pie in the sky ideas um, because it fed to their base and it used fear. And in my opinion, a little bit of manipulation to fire people up, to get the fundraising goings for them and to make the UCP look bad. Um, sometimes they presented real credible solutions that I think, you know, maybe could have been implemented. Um, not what I would have done, but potentially credible. And other times, I think there was a lot of fear mongering that occurred um, that was just feeding into their base to make Jason Kenney look bad. And and I wish that they would have done better at promoting positive messages rather than just, you know, the negative messages they were on for so long. And, and I will say this before we move on, that I wish the Conservatives would have done that as well to reach across the aisle and say, hey, NDP, how can we work together to make sure that everyone gets a vaccine, but also everyone gets proper treatments? We don't have lockdowns anymore. How can we work together? Because we saw that in the federal election during before the leaders debate where they the leaders of all the parties got together and they all looked like they're kumbaya and they're saying everyone should get a vaccination. But it doesn't seem like that has spilled over to Alberta politics quite yet. I and the hard part is like, and I wish there was more pan-partisan sharing, like even in the ledge, if the NDP makes an amendment on a bill, even if it's a perfectly reasonable amendment, there's nothing wrong with, the conservatives wouldn't accept it. And when the NDP were in power, same thing, you don't accept amendments because then the other side takes credit for anything good that occurs, right? Yeah. And if it wasn't for us, you know, the conservatives would have dropped the ball. And so I don't like it. But I think that that's, unfortunately, we don't see a lot of, um, you know, the opposition helping or taking credit for things. That's true. Um, we are in a, 
a kind of a leaderless vacuum in the conservative movement today because Aaron O'Toole seems to be dropping the ball. He doesn't seem to be out as much as everyone wants him to be. Jason Kenny seems to be trying to pick up the pieces before Brian Jean, if he does enter politics again, decides to enter politics again. Where does the conservative movement in Canada go from here? Is it centrist? Is it going back to the Harper days where it was sort of rule with an iron fist in some sense? It's hard because um, attitudes and perspectives and the needs of public opinion have changed a lot since Harper days, right? Um, so things like climate change or LGBTQ rights or those types of things have shifted significantly in the past 10, 15, 20 years, right? Um, some A friend of mine told me that, um, you know, you go to a conservative convention and it's, um, you know, gay men smoking marijuana, <laughs> whereas before that was not to be seen anywhere by the And so it's, uh, but then you also have in the conservative movement, you know, the rural, um, you know, more redneck, I want my guns and don't take away my freedoms thing too. So such a big tent party that it's hard to bring everybody in together where you can get enough votes that you need. So the, the social progressives and the, um, you know, it's hard to get everybody in one big tent, right? So what's the path forward then? Because that, that at the end of the day, that's what we're, 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 we're heading is unless the conservatives can get a big tent party together where everyone seems to, like I said, and I hate to use the word again, but kumbaya, mm -hmm. the liberals are going to continue to win with 30% of the vote with less votes than the conservatives because cities vote more, or there are more seats in cities than there are in rural uh, Canada. Yeah, and it's hard, like O'Toole ran on a true blue stance, <laughs> and blue usually means socially progressive, um, and I don't know whether he said it or not, but it was implied that he was pro-life. Um, I've been involved in some conservative nominations, um, and the difficult part is that if you have the homeschoolers and the churches and the, you know those type of grassroots organizations, they can get these candidates, they can fundraise for them, they can get them elected, but that may not necessarily be, be indicative of the general base of the population. Um, I've seen the same thing happen with ethnic groups where you may have a certain ethnic candidate and they can rally 50 of whatever ethnicity or, or two, you know, 200 and they all vote for this guy and you're like, hey, he seems like a good guy. But just because 200 of whatever ethnicity voted for him doesn't mean that he reflects the broad population. So it's it's hard. I think that as as time progresses, people are becoming more centrist. I, I think the general population is. I know that I am. So I think the Conservative Party needs to move with that as well. But you know, it's hard to tell which topics because um, we don't want to see be seen as ten years behind the times. Um, so I almost think that we need to find. Um, a conservative solution to some modern problems. The one thing that I heard over and over again during the last election was Aaron O'Toole would have been a great leader in 2019 because they ran a very social conservative with Andrew Scheer, who is more of the pro-life uh, social conservative that you typically look for. Uh, he would have done better in 2019 than he did in 2021. It's now playing that catch-up game. And you, like you said, you're doing that 10 years out. To sort of pivot back to provincial politics a little bit here, because like, it's, like we said, in the way I think you agree upon, Jason Kenney is kind of the conservative kingmaker in this country. He endorsed O'Toole and he became leader of the CPC. Does does Jason is Jason Kenny moving in that direction where he needs to be more centrist, or is he still his reform Canadian Alliance ways? Do you think? <laughs> you know, it's so. Yeah. Like Jason Kenny, um, number one, it was incredible that he was able to take the PCs and Wild Rose and merge them together to make a central party. Um, so I give him a lot of credit for that, and for winning with the strong majority that he did, I give him a lot of credit for that as well. Um, the traditional conservative um, is somebody that believes in balanced budgets, right? Um, Canadian PAC, Taxpayer Federation, smaller government, and all those things. Um, right now, for example, then they are, um, you know, they've proposed uh, whatever it is, two or three percent cut to nurses, um, which I think optically looks really bad. Now, you and I both know, Chris, that if you're selling, you know, a car and I offer you 
um, you know, and you sell it for, you're offering it for 1500, I offer you a thousand and we meet in the middle. So I don't think that there's a cut coming for nurses and teachers. I, I think that it's a, they want plus five, we want minus five, you meet in the middle. Um, but I wonder whether if they gave nurses and teachers all a 2% raise, especially with oil prices going up the way they are, we have all these unexpected revenues, then we could say we're the only government that actually gave you know, small raises, mind you, but raises to nurses and teachers. We, we actually took care of people. And I wonder whether they could get more moderates or people that aren't as politically active um, back on their side. Um, so I think that the balance the budget at all costs Canadian Taxpayer Federation approach um, isn't going to get Conservatives re-elected again. I don't think that if you were to knock on doors and say, um, you know, the debt is a big problem, I don't think that that's top of mind to a lot of people. I think that's unfortunate because I think we certainly do need to be careful how much money we spend. Um, but the debt and fiscal conservatism, um, although it's important, I don't think that that's um, the number one priority to a lot of people. And that's usually a a big conservative priority. So we need to shift our approach a little bit on some of those things. I'm going to ask a pointed question here, and I've been doing that throughout this uh, 25, 30 minute interview already, but is Jason Kenney an arrow tool of the leaders the conservative movement needs today, or is there somebody else that we should be looking at? <sighs> it's hard to tell. Like, um, I think that Jason Kenney's hashtag best summer ever um didn't work out as planned i think the delta variant you know spread quicker um and so i feel like that was a hail mary pass and i'm i'm not sure whether the ball was caught or not um and, and i don't know whether um to whether we blame um kenny or, or or not on on this fourth wave and, and things like that i don't know whether his name is re-electable certainly right now it's not um now you kenny think so? I, I, okay, I'm going to challenge you on this right now because I've okay. been having I've been having this fight with my husband for the last like probably about two and a half weeks. Yeah, the conservatives are great at rebranding themselves every five like months. Yeah, um, Redford was supposed to lose, she won. Stelnick was supposed to lose, he won. And I, do you, do you honestly think? And this is just me being me and me talking to Spencer here. Do you honestly think that if the election was held like in five months' time, so March twenty twenty two, Kenny would be defeated? <sighs> Conservatives are very good. So <laughs> when I door knocked with them, jobs, the economy, pipelines, yeah, and COVID has caused a huge division um, among. Um, the centrist or left wing who think lockdown should have occurred quicker or more lockdown and vaccine passport should have occurred quicker um, versus the far right and the, uh, I don't know where Brian Jean stands on the vaccine passport, but I'd love to hear his opinion on it. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people would love to hear his opinion on that one. And it's a no-win situation for him. Like if he says that he's, anyway, it's a no-win situation. So he's going to avoid that question at all costs. Um, but I think that... Um, a lot of the polls right now have showed that the UCP is behind. The NDP has out fundraised us substantially. Um, so I think if an election was called right away, I think we'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs>
I, I never count Jason Kinney out. I will count Andrew Shearer out. I will count uh, Aaron O'Toole out whenever the polls look bad. But Jason Kenny seems he he seems to be a miracle worker with some things because a lot of people did not expect that unity vote to be such an overwhelming support. So I will never count out uh, Jason Kenny to potentially lose an election. It just doesn't seem possible to me. You know, and that's a fair point. If you look at his record, he's won everything that he's tried and he's won it very decisively. And he's always done better than what the pundits have said he was going to do. Right. Does he have a chance at leaving the Conservative Party? Because that's the like the federal Conservative Party, because that's the the talk of every political pundit ever is will Jason Kenney, if someone steps down, take a run at the federal Conservatives to say, look what I did in Alberta. In your opinion, does that interest him or do you think that's just people just talking heads? I think that it would have certainly at one point. <laughs> um, I think that um, uh, I don't know whether, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there's a double standard for Conservatives. Like Trudeau had blackface, SNC Lavalin, you know, um, Judy Wilson Raybould, was it Indian in the Cupboard, the book that came out, something like yep. that. Indian in the um, cabinet. Indian in the cabinet. That's Indian right. in the She's, cupboard is the is the uh, Disney the movie. movie. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And some very pointed things were said to and about Justin Trudeau by people close to him, and he made a lot of mistakes, and it didn't seem to affect him. Um, but I'm not sure whether the same standard applies to conservatives. Um, so I wonder whether that would um, stick, and at a federal level, level whether that would hurt. Um, I think that if COVID, if we can turn around COVID quickly, reopen, um, the UCP has announced some tremendous, some huge, um, you know, opportunities lately, like the tech sector in Calgary is taking off, um, among us, is it among us about whatever it is, is filming at the legislature right now of all the places, huge project is bigger than Game of Thrones. So the, the film sent the film industry, the tech industry, um, the oil sector is taking off. They've announced some huge projects. We're even building these huge solar panels that are the size of like 30 football fields. Like there's a lot of things that are going right. Um, but COVID continues to be that thing kind of in the back of the head. That's just, so if COVID went away and goes away quickly and we can focus on jobs, economy and pipelines, I think we're in good shape. Um, otherwise it's, it's going to be hard. I'm going to, I'm going to just jump on the comment you just said. I think we do give a pass to the liberals a lot in this country, and I don't know why. During the 2019 election, and this, this is the moment when I, when I started to think, okay, maybe it's time the liberals need to just step back and get off their high horses, because the blackface scandal hit. And it, like, not just once, twice, but three photos came out of Justin Trudeau in blackface. About three days later, yet again, to his own volition, Andrew Shearer said, well, I'm half American. And more people got confused and upset about the fact that he was an half American than Justin Trudeau in blackface. That bothered me, and I don't know why it didn't bother more liberal supporters. Yeah. I, I heard in the States that there was um, senators that um, appeared in blackface in a yearbook photo 50 years ago, and we're getting sacked over it. Um, but it, it didn't seem to have an effect on Teflon. I, I don't like calling names to Trudeau, but uh, I think it, Teflon's okay to call him, but it, everything just seems to bounce off. I, I don't know how he survives. I honestly, and that is just my opinion. And I just, he, Even, he, uh, he can go on vacation on yeah. Truth and Reconciliation Day and okay, three days later, it's not a story anymore. That, that's, yeah, that I was just going to bring up that. It's incredible. Can you imagine a conservative leader doing that? If Jason Kenney or Aaron O'Toole did that, the media would still be hounding them today. Yeah. He, even if he did, they did what Trudeau did, which was go to BC First Nations and sit with them and listen to them speak, there would still be a conversation. It seems like we have officially given another free pass to Justin Trudeau. I don't know whether it's a similar, I think it's a fair comparison, but last Christmas when you had a UCP minister um, you know, go to Hawaii over Christmas time, right? Yep. Aloha uh, which, Gate. Aloha Gate. Yeah, yeah, it even had a big name for it, and it lasted for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was in the media news cycle for a long time. So similarly, there was a travel advisory, um, right? And a politician decided to you know, break the travel advisory, which wasn't 
technically against COVID rules, right? You could have gone to Hawaii if you wanted to, Chris. Yeah. Um, but the optics were certainly bad. Um, and uh, Trudeau did the same thing and, you know, it didn't seem to make a big deal. So I, I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate that there's a double standard for sure. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, my last question before we start wrapping up here, Spencer, is this. Conservatives have some hard choices to make and hard decisions to make of who they want to be, how they want to brand themselves, but also where they move forward in today's society. Uh, are they the party of 10 years ago trying to catch up? Are they the party of the future? Are they the party of jobs, the economy, and uh, pipelines? Or are they the party of the fourth wave? How if you were speaking to the conservatives, like all the conservatives listen to this podcast right now, what would you say to them about how we can move the conservative movement forward? I think number one, that the leader needs to be um, relatable and humble. And if they make mistakes to admit it, <laughs> um, I think that sometimes conservatives tend to be a little bit arrogant or, or not relatable enough. Um, but I think that if you had a regular Joe Alberta that was relatable enough, that could realize when he made mistakes and strive to correct them, um, like Rachel Notley, which I don't agree with her policies, um, but people seem to like Rachel Notley or Janice Irwin. And I'm not saying the Conservatives should be Janice Irwin or Rachel Notley, but they're likable. <laughs> so we have to find, number one, a Conservative politician that's likable. Um, that's you don't think there is people. one right now? I think there is. Have you ever met Jason Kenney, Chris? I have had the pleasure of meeting him in 2011 when Aaron O'Toole ran for the leadership, or when Aaron O'Toole run, ran for the by-election that Bev Oda stepped down in, and Jason Kenney came to his campaign launch. That was the only time I've ever had to met him. I want him on the show. If he's listening to this, hey, Jason, come on on. I'd love to chat with you for a half hour, 40 minutes. Sure. I, I met, I, so I met the premier several times. Um, I met him uh, recently over the summer. Uh, and he, when you meet him um, and he shakes your hand, it's like he's looking into your soul in a good way. Like, like Chris, how's it going? How's the wife? What's going on? Like he's very, I met Amber G. Sohi and I got a similar vibe from Sohi. Again, I don't agree with Sohi, but um, you know, an immediate strong charisma, um, which I think is great. Um, I think that where the premier could improve a little bit is when he makes a mistake to own it, admit it, and apologize. Um, I think that, um, that a lack of um, humility um, has sometimes caused him and other politicians to, to get in trouble and to have bad relationships with the media and with uh, their constituents. I Authentic politicians are hard to come across these days. I will agree with you. I, I met Amarjeet Sohi when I was up in Slave Lake and I was uh, uh, working for the town and he came as a uh, minister of communities, if I'm not mistaken. And he did, he did what you said. He, he looked directly in your eyes like, this is awkward. Like you're, you're not the politician who's already looking at the next person while you're shaking my hand. Uh, Jason Kenney, I got that vibe from him when I met him in 2011. So politicians like that are hard to come across and uh while i can say i probably met about five or six of them in my lifetime there are a few that i would love to meet because i get the vibe that they are like that i just haven't had the chance to meet them and you know it's uh so like i recently helped with a municipal race in spruce grove um and i got would to know you, would you want which the candidate won if i'm not mistaken correct she did yeah she by did. quite a bit <laughs> yeah last time Anyways, she did very well. And it was the first first person of color um, to win in Spruce Grove politics, which was amazing. Um, and, um, you know, not to spend too much time on this, but she had an amazing background of helping at Parkland Pregnancy Center. She's done a ton of work with the homeless, with food banks and those types of things. But what I helped her with was a little bit of polish. Um, so she'd say something, I'd be like, you know, why do you say it this way? And I was kind of, um, you know, uh, her salesperson, if you will, and <laughs> helping her to sell herself. People have said, Spence, why don't you run for politics? I know how to sell myself. But the problem is I, people would say, what have you done for Spruce Grove? I couldn't tell you what I've done for Spruce Grove. You know, how have you volunteered? Do you need, do you know the needs of the community? <laughs> no. <laughs> and so it's hard to find somebody who uh, knows the community, has the right background, and somebody who has the charisma and the political sense. So to be able to find that balance between somebody who can sell themselves and somebody who has the right life and or work experience is, is very hard. 
It is, and I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope the people who are coming out of the woodworks to start running for the 2023, that's right, 2023, we're still a year and a half away from the next election, but people are already putting their name forward, that these people have the best interest in the community, because I, I find that some people just do it for a vanity project, and I hope that that's not the case anymore. Well, for sure. And even like on the federal level, the pensions are pretty awesome. Like if you're in for what is it, five or six years, you have a pension for life. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's unfortunate. I think that that's ridiculous. Like Carrie Dio was, I don't know, three weeks away from a, a pension for life. <laughs> It'd be like one, one number away from a winning lottery ticket. <laughs> I, I feel like the uh, Canadian government should go away with the uh, Ralph Klein way, which is get rid of the pensions for life because if you are just in it for a pension for life after six years, then the, you need to resign and go away. And I know there's a lot of people out there who are. There's a lot of people who are still in Parliament after about 40 years, it seems like, who just need to go away because their pensions are going to be massive and it's going to cost us the taxpayers an arm and a leg once they do retire. And then there's the transition allowance. It's just enough's enough. And whether it be for the money or the power, um, like I know a lot of MLAs who took a significant pay cut, um, and uh, but they did it because they want to serve their community. They're doing hopefully they're doing the right thing through the right reason, right? Yeah. And, and I think there's a lot of and a lot of that on all sides, right? I shouldn't paint a broad stroke saying all the liberals are corrupt or all the conservatives or all the NDP are corrupt. There are good people on all sides who do it for the right reasons. I just wish their voices were heard a lot more than the people who aren't. And the hard part is, Chris, so I've been involved with a bunch of conservative things. And if you send out an email saying Gerald Butts and his global UN is going to destroy oil and blah, 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 you get a lot of money. I tell you what, like, it's very, like, effective. The more fear and same as the NDP, you know, the UCP is killing and the children are going to go to schools and, you know, they don't care about if your kids die. It works, right? Fear sells. But a well-balanced, articulate article that explains both sides and a little bit of nuance doesn't sell, doesn't get emotion, and only has five people read it. Um, so as a society, we're getting too polarized, where people are too caught up, uh, you know, on one or two issues that they don't know very much about, and and emotion overrules, um, you know, strong facts sometimes, which is unfortunate. And that's where this show comes into play, because I want to have those actual conversations with everyone, because we hide behind 280 characters on Twitter or, or however many characters they are right now. And politicians have seen are seen to be just the 15 second soundbite now. How can we sell ourselves in 15 second soundbites? The elevator pitches, we call it on the trail, right? 100%. It is sad that that's the way that the world has gone to, but I'm hoping to change that one, one, one conversation at a time. Um, and, and you look at the debates too, they're just looking to land a big punch that will make the highlight, right? Yeah. You had so there's no real sir, substance. Yeah, math is hard. It's, it is a gong show that question period, it's not even question period, it's now like 10 second clip it for the nightly news question period. Well, it's, it's not an answer period, it's a question period. Oh, that's true too, that's true. <laughs> that's true. And both sides do it quite well. How, how, how to not answer a question in two easy steps. Okay, Blame the speaker. previous government. There you go, exactly. Even yeah. if you've been in power for 10 years, which it seems like Justin Trudeau is on his way to do that. And it seems like he's always gonna blame Stephen Harper for something. Correct, yeah, he's always lurking. Um, Spencer, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been fun and exciting. And um, I, I will have you back on the show closer to the next election to talk about the conservative movement and where the UCP need to do well, because it seems like, like you said, if the polls are to be believed, they're going down to defeat. But I not believe in any polls, because if that's the case, we have a liberal majority government right now. And that's not the case in Ottawa. I, I once heard Jason Kenney say that dogs best know what polls are for. <laughs> Amen to that. Spencer, thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thanks so much, Chris.